This podcast is sponsored by the Music Player Network at musicplayer.com, the premier musician resource for keyboard players and beyond. Since the year 2000, the Music Player Network has been the go-to source for news and views on music technology, playing tips, and gigging help. The Keyboard Corner is one of the longest-running keyboard forums in Internet history, with guitar, bass, drum, and numerous recording and music tech forums also on offer. Frequented by weekend warriors, manufacturers' representatives, and professionals alike, MPN provides an invaluable resource for any musician, and it's 100% free to sign up and use. Go to www.musicplayer.com to see for yourself. Welcome to episode 22 of the Keyboard Chronicles, a podcast for keyboard players of the gigging variety. I'm your host, David Holloway, and it's great as always to be here with you. Our guest this episode is Mr. Peter Vitesi. Like a lot of our guests, Peter's had an incredibly varied career from playing with Jethro Tull and Simple Minds to co-writing, arranging and producing songs with a vast array of artists, including Heather Small, Julian Lennon and Annie Lennox. It's getting to be a bit of a cliche on this show, but Peter is a prolific, busy and erudite keyboard player that has some brilliant insights. I know I enjoyed this interview and I think you will too. Enjoy. Peter, can't thank you enough for joining us. I know it's uh, middle of the day and uh, a nice summer day. It's a gorgeous summer day here. In fact, it's um, you know, we're it's incredibly hot. I do believe it might be over thirty-three uh, degrees. Um, so anyway, but it's lovely to join you but, in this uh, glorious weather. And that is hot for the UK. And um, we did talk before the show between my Australian accent that I constantly get feedback on from our listeners and and your lovely Scottish accent. I, I'm looking forward to a fun, <laughs> fun, fun episode. Um, yes. Um. <laughs> it's, it's part of the fun. So um, I thought we just might start off with a question we've asked the last few episodes in that, that is given the challenging times we're all going through internationally, how are you keeping busy um, over these past few months? Um, it's a it's an interesting question. I, I, I've I've tried I've tried to answer some of my friends um, um, in this way, especially my friends who are fellow students in, as I mentioned to you earlier, in, in my philosophy uh, studies. As um, I what I'm what I miss is the at least perception of free will. That's the um, uh, that comes with a certain kind of dynamism and vitality when you can perceive that you have free will when there's a some kind of restriction or some kind of threat um, uh, you know it's obviously uh, it's wise for us to um, you know to go into some kind of lockdown but then I go on to uh, often say well I've been in lockdown essentially for about four years now um, <laughs> because uh, largely I I work largely from home i have a studio at home and um I, I some some of the projects that i do are unattended um and can be conducted in a, a tinter web kind of a kind of way but um uh, I, how i'm I, I don't necessarily keep busy because it's um that suggests that um that has a suggestion that uh, when i'm not when i'm not doing this I'm not busy. Um, I have. Um, I I like to say that um, the American astronauts in the um, at least the first phase, the first seven, the so-called Mercury Seven, used to uh, used to say to one another when asked how they were, they would say, "I'm maintaining an even strain." Um, <laughs> so the the busyness is um, is is what you make of your life. Uh, I, I I do believe. So I've I've been constantly uh doing things manifesting even if it's for fun i did um for instance i did uh at the beginning of lockdown we uh, a few years ago we got a little doggy um phoebe who's a border terrier 
And of course, um, uh, uh, I started to sing songs to Phoebe. Um, There's a little dog called Phoebe, and so on and so forth. And um, so at the beginning of lockdown, I, I did a whole album uh, of songs that were about Phoebe, all these silly songs that I did. But also I included in my head um, the arrangements that, that um, came out, uh, which, in, for instance, um, one of them, which is uh, There is Naughtiness in This Room, which is one of the titles of the song. And um, some somehow it came out like a kind of a, a Western uh, thing. It had a harmonica in it, and it had... <laughs> so I did a whole track with this kind of... And the, this, the tune goes, There is naughtiness in this room, but there is beauty in this room. And so it goes on like this. So uh, I, that was one way of me to occupy the, um, the, the constant throughput of musical ideas that, um, the, the, that uh, lockdown um, seemed to engender. And will, so this, I, I, will this ever be released, fun. Peter? So will that no, ever be? No. There's a lot of dog no. lovers out there. That's right, but of course it's it's dedicated to Phoebe. By the way, she's uh, wholly unimpressed, which is um, <laughs> which is of course a a, a standard uh, a standard response to most of my musical output. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. So let let's start off, Peter, with a bit of a potted history of you um, at the beginning. So um, your biography is relatively well known in that you started very young, but I just love to hear about how you started out in music and, and particularly your initial stuff. Uh, it's something that's well mostly faded away. Those brilliant big band nights and stuff, particularly in the UK and to some extent in Australia, just would love to hear more about how that got you started and, and your memories of that. Ah, uh, yeah. Well, um, uh, I, I like to say um, th th there are pros and cons uh, to this, uh, I think, David. Um, I say I was a musician before I decided to become a musician. You know, the, the decision, you know, you often hear, uh, you know, the stories go that and, and some, you know, something uh, crucial or some kind of epiphany uh, occurred where somebody decided uh, at that point, you know, because they heard you know, Cannonball Adderley or something to become a musician. But I'd actually, I, I was actually a musician before I was able to, able to make that choice. I, I had, I had no choice. <laughs> and if I had no choice, <laughs> I'm not morally responsible. Um, so, um, um, my father was a big band saxophone player. This is uh, quite well known in the Brechin. That's Brechin in Angus, uh, which is about, uh, 20 miles north of Dundee in Scotland. And um, he being um, the, the my father's on my father's side of the family, they were Italians. My mother was Scottish, but they, they were Italians. And during the war, the Italians had uh, some difficulty, as you might uh, as you might imagine. Um, my father, for instance, was arrested um, uh, whilst fighting on um, in the British Army. Um, but Churchill had decided to lock the Italians up and intern them um, with the um um uh, with the german uh, jews in the isle of man and when my father came back and his brothers came back they they uh, formed a concert party uh, one way or another to in in order to assimilate and um uh, and be part of the um uh, you know the brechin a very small town be part of that society and uh, you know uh, become integrated and so it started really as a concert party. And my earliest memories of playing with my dad uh, was when I would play uh, with the concert party, which is my dad and his brothers, all of whom were musicians, and um, and my uncle Abby. In fact, it's a very very clear memory of my uncle Abby uh, transforming from a shopkeeper uh, during the day to, uh, to in the evening entertaining the, um, the the patients of Stracathro Hospital by dressing up with a bowl of fruit on his head uh, and a very f uh, flowery um, dress and uh, coming on as Carmen Miranda and singing um, uh, South American Way. Uh, of course, it was, um, and, and this was music that uh, that didn't have any uh, meaning for, uh, for me at the time. I must have been even at that time, I could play uh, quite well by the time I was six or, or seven polyphonically, and I was able to, you know, understood a, a lot about chords and altered chords by then. And um, but by the time I was six, seven, eight, and witnessing um, Uncle Abby and 
Uncle Jimmy uh, doing these these kinds of songs. <clears throat> They had no meaning to me, but what I, I understand now, and all of this is perhaps you know hindsight 2020 or revisionist, is that they they absolutely anchored my they grounded my understanding of the beauty of music in harmony, um, and um, I loved I, I loved the harmony of of that age, and uh, it enabled me via my dad's. Uh, musicianship and stuff to be able to to uh, at least if if it didn't mean much to me uh, it, it meant a lot later on you know mm -hmm. so but if it didn't mean much to me right at that time it sure meant a lot later and um that's never that's never left me the the beauty of of the harmony of the age the longing of those songs the just the beauty of them mm -hmm. I, I think um that's never left me and that's my um that was my father's um uh gift um uh, to me however my um my eldest brother and i um talk about there were differences between uh, my experience of my father and my eldest brother uh joey um which is my eldest brother um <clears throat> who now who went on to be a, a brilliant um um uh, educator school teacher and um geography master but um he he was i think made to play saxophone by my father and um when uh, when joey was playing in a section uh, my father would say right get up stand up and take a chorus which is you know the mm -hmm. old-fashioned speak for stand up and improvise over these changes whatever it would be a, a jazz tune or a stand-up and um and joey in his head he just heard my father hates me because he yeah. he couldn't do it, he couldn't improvise. He was a good reader, but he couldn't improvise. Uh, Twenty years later, when my dad would say, "Right, take a chorus," and I go, "Oh, my dad loves me," yeah. because <laughs> because he knows I'm just going to tear the living daylights out of this. And in fact, my father and I um, had great uh, difficulty with one another latterly because I would want to I would want to take chorus after chorus after chorus <laughs> to get stuff going and he was trying to stop me and and couldn't and and i wouldn't stop you know and being a, a, a rebellious uh, teenager at that point it, it got ugly at times yeah <laughs> at very least but that's that's an amazing story as you said you you didn't initially love it by any means and it is a bit like most families you you were working in the family business and in your case it was music and it was the harmony yep. that you loved. So, and I know in another oh, yeah. interview you've said you still see um, playing the piano as your primary form of creative expression. What That's what right. is it that went from working in the family business, so to speak, to having that real love for the piano? What what was the next step for you that led to that? Um, uh, let me see. It's 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 complex. It's now so. It's now it's now absolutely integrated into my being. Mm -hmm. The so when I was f uh, I was about four years old, and um, they had in the house um, a pedal organ, and my uncle William's piano. And when I went, when I was four, I I, I can remember, I, I you know, you can see and I can witness most kids go up to piano. And when I play piano with children around, they'll bang about. But when I went up to the piano, there was, I, I felt an instant, um, you know, it sounds so hokey, doesn't this connection? <laughs> I felt affinity. I felt um, a lovely symbiosis beginning to take place where, uh, the first thing I did was play a chord. The chord was a C triad, of course, <laughs> but I, 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 I quickly, I quickly, um, you know, moved up the scale so that you you would get C major, D minor, E minor, F major, and uh, the B minor with the flat five. And um, I wondered about that for so long. This is before I went to piano lessons, and I wondered about this B minor flat five and um, you know, preceding the the you know covering the octave. And uh, and at times it would I you know this thing of um, if if we arrive on Earth with any anything if if you you know there's two ways of expressing this at, at very least there's a nativist account for instance in the acquisition of language there's a nativist account which suggests this is Noam Chomsky uh, that suggests there's something pre-existing. Uh, 
uh, a neurological uh, or a psychological uh, module that acquires language and is able to discern in the mm. booming buzzing of the environment that discerns and picks out language, um, you know, and the principles of language uh, known as universal grammar. And um, the same is true, uh, uh, or you could, go, I, I should say that the other, the other view is empiricist, which is, uh, you know, we're born with a blank slate, and uh, then all of this is, is learned via mm. experience. Um, but I, I tend to um, go along with the nativist view because I picked out principles uh, of music making that weren't taught, uh, that weren't simply experiential. They, 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 they coincided with something that, that you may now regard as having an opinion about what's good or bad. And uh, I, I can I can remember, as I say, pondering the B minor flat five in that in that triad, um, and why on occasions it was nice and why on occasions it was horrid. And I realised it was horrid when it was used in ignorance, uh, and it was lovely when somebody used it with purpose mm. or uh, with what something that connoted an understanding of, of its existence rather than simply a, a mechanical function. Yeah, that's a really fascinating um, insight. And, and just even that, you know, working your way through the chords at that age. And so once once you'd, you'd played with your, your family, what, what was your first gig outside of the family, do you recall? Um, outside of the family. Well, my, my family, at that time, we're talking the very early 60s mm. now, and... Um, my, for instance, I, I have to just um, digress slightly because it, it leads on from the previous point. Um, if you've ever seen Rick Beato, um, oh, yeah. who I think is a, um, I think is great, and um, his son, uh, you know, um, it, it, you know, quite phenomenal. And um, his 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 son at eight years old was identifying notes and in, in harmony and uh, uh, singing them and uh, and naming them. Well, I, my family didn't know what to do with that, but my dad did say things like, um, uh, you know, name, you know, name this chord crunch, you know, a cluster chord, or, um, or, uh, uh, or for instance, he would do something that I call pitch memory, which is, uh, you know, one week he would press the horn on his feet at 500, and then <laughs> um, two weeks would elapse, and he would say, now bef before I press it again, sing me the note, and I go. Duh! And he press the horn, Duh! and he going, "How do you do that?" And 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 it's a little bit like um, uh, the scene in um, uh, what's that? The Dustin Hoffman, oh, Rain um, Man, Rain Man, when the when the matches spill and he goes three hundred or what, whatever yeah. it is, is that there's there's uh, I'm not I don't have a tone in my head, I, I, I I'm calling it pitch memory. I have a a memory that that is like the the idea of uh, about to speak a sentence as if as if you knew what the sentence was going to be somehow um except it's not expressed uh, you know in you know verbal mm. you know physical uh, way uh, i knew what the the i knew what it was but i personally think in my case it's a uh, pitch memory a good one it's not infallible um uh, uh, but it's but it's a very good one so it leads on to when I when my first gig because outside of outside of dad's uh, you know the the bosom of my family and my family really didn't know what to do about somebody that that could that could evince this uh, talent or skill or whatever you call it and um, uh, the only thing they could think of doing with me is put me in talent competitions. And I think I've spoken about this on the, uh, on, on the internet before. It's one of my first, not that it's important, but one of my first little descriptions of coming up through this talent competition I was entered into in air, Butlins in air in Scotland. And uh, I got through to the final, but I was beaten in the final. And in the final, I was playing for the benefit of Mr. Kite, from uh, no, uh, which from uh, you know one of the the more obscure cuts cuts from um, Sergeant Pepper album. So this would be about sixty seven, and um, 
And I, I was playing for the benefit of Mr. Kite and segueing into a Peter Cook and Dudley Moore song called Goodbye. And uh, I thought I was unbeatable on this on this basis because I could play, I could sing. Uh, it was all great. And I got thoroughly, absolutely thrashed by this this kid that was uh, about a year or two younger than me, but he dressed as a baby. <laughs> and he came on and sang um, a, a largely tuneless version. Everybody has a baby, that's why I'm in love with you, pretty baby. <laughs> and he he thrashed me. And um, uh, you know, from that point um, that point on, I've I've understood that there are there are other aspects to the communication of music that are clearly important to some people, but that leads that leads me to the idea of pure music versus the idea of music as entertainment and um that's a big long yeah discussion. that's yeah that's another couple of episodes <laughs> that's a couple of episodes but that was my that was my experience it was a sour experience for me and i, I, I haven't wanted it to to weigh heavily on my mind but it, has, it probably has yeah. for for five or six decades and um uh, it's it, it, that was the that was the first experience outside the bosom of my family where where it became where it became obvious that the 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 skill or the talent or whatever it was was in the real world was was going to be um was going to be on occasion an advantage and on others a disadvantage mm. yeah that's another great point and i mean for you when did that real world experience with music start like did you essentially leave school and go straight into music or you're doing other things alongside it the whole thing was really i suppose decided for me um by my father i, I i'd always been a musician since i was four i, I was a, a part-time schoolboy and a full-time musician so mm. from about four really is is the explanation of playing in bands dad's band my brother-in-law's band my brother's band rock bands jazz bands from about 12, 12 onwards, um, you know, that I, I just played all the time, all, all music um, and all gratefully in, and Scottish country dance bands as well. I, I played and that was great fun playing mm -hmm. with uh, the great champion uh, accordion player, Jim McHardy. Um, and that's something because he was a, a button key accordion player, quite an extraordinary thing, you know, souk and blow, as they call it, you know, it's the, 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 when you blow the note, it's one note. And when you, uh, and when yeah. you pull the thing out, it's another note. So it's, it's two notes per key. Uh, right. And it's quite extraordinary, the, the, the capability, but, um, the whole, my whole, um, the whole thing for me was pretty much, it was my father that made it. Uh, 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 no alternative, and and the first occasion when when he offered me no alternative was when I was languishing in my my bed. I was about sixteen or seventeen. I was languishing in my bed at midday, and um, uh, and the the an army careers uh, caravan had pulled up in the middle of Brechin uh, town centre, and Dad dragged me across the road to uh, to enlist in the army. Uh, by good fortune, uh, certainly at that time, um, the army were unwilling to sign up anybody that was already crying. And um, <laughs> so, so, <laughs> so, so I, I dare say I didn't pass muster. But Dad kicked me out of the house. That was the first of, I think, three leaving leaving home at the end of my father's shoe. Uh, and um, I did actually manage to get a job. My first job was organ demonstrator at... Uh, Largs, the music shop in Montrose, and I demonstrated organ organs there until uh, uh, organs uh, even then. So when would that be about seventy three thereabouts? Um, organs began began to be um, started to move from you had to play the whole thing yourself to auto accompaniment yeah. things, and um, then they became less attractive to be, but but more attractive to um uh, you know the casual that's right player and so on so um uh and then father moved uh down to near edinburgh and um i i tried to look after his businesses he had a, a business several shops um in dundee and uh for for um i had a shop in <laughs> in blair gowrie selling um um, clothes, but I was hopeless at it. I was, I'm just hopeless. And um, so uh, I 
when I was about 18, dad uh, kicked me out of the house again. Um, this time to go and uh, play keyboards um, down at the Locarno Ballroom in Bristol for strict temp- tempo dancing, like um, with the Billy Cahoon Ensemble, um, which played uh, on the other side of the, the stage from a you know um, a revolving stage oh, yeah. from um, Tommy Sampson's big band. And uh, I suppose it was another exposure to the the joys of the big band. And I, you know, worked my way into the uh, various bigger band ensembles um, as a result of that. I mean, I got the sack from um, uh, from the Locarno Ballroom for um, I think it was for rehearsing during during the daylight hours uh, with an with another band and the uh, and um, so I was sacked. Went back home and the next time that Dad kicked me out was to uh, go down and uh, 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 and audition for a, a band called Jethro Tull. Right. Um, that's the next time. And actually, I left. I did leave the door of one Abbotsford Rise in Livingston near Edinburgh. I left the door uh, at the end of my father's shoe. I can remember that distinctly. Mm-hmm. And thank goodness. Um, he, he he insisted that if I was that smart, then I go and prove it. Yeah. And, uh, and, and I've singularly failed to do that anyway. So... <laughs> 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 but I mean, by, by the mid, early to mid seventies, which sounds like that is, I mean, so your dad was either very aware of Jethro Tull because they were obviously um, doing extremely well at that stage, um, or he just yeah. was a band and he decided you needed to go and audition for them. No, it wasn't. Uh, it wasn't that. It was that I I had been playing in the Lee Rig uh, pub in uh, Edinburgh with my great friend Mike Travis who was who had returned from at the time returned from London as a you know a session player and a brilliant drummer and he was in a band called Gilgamesh mm-hmm. and he and I used to do a duo gig at the uh, Lyric pub in Edinburgh in fact I wrote down we um we used to our opening number was um we would play um uh, the man in the was the man in the green hat, which is on the Weather Report album Tail Spinning, oh, yeah. uh, Tail Spinning, and we would play that as the opening track to the bemused punters in the uh, Lee Rig. I, I mean, I can't imagine, uh, you know, how alien that must have sounded, <laughs> but um, they 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 seem to enjoy it anyway. Um, but um, I I digress. What happened was. Mike came in one night and he had a, a, a melody maker, which was the rock newspaper mm. of the time. And in the back of that, there was an advert that said, international rock bands require keyboard player. And he said, Mike said to me, you should you should apply for this. And I, well, I did. And um, it just so happened I was playing with a, another band RAF, which which was an acronym for rich and famous, neither of which they were, uh, <laughs> but we were doing a gig in the Marquee Club in uh, in London, one gig, and I invited Ian Anderson and mm. um, Martin Barr and Dave Pegg of Jethro Tull of the lineup at the time to come and see me play, and then they invited me to audition for Jethro Tull, and um, when when they when they contacted my parents to, or the management of Jethro Tull contacted my parents saying, uh, you know, uh, can Peter come down to audition? Um, it was my dad that said, right, uh, out, go and get, you know, go and get this right. job. And um, he didn't know uh, Jethro Tull from a, a hole in the wall. No, that's why I um, assumed so. I just thought, yeah, that was an interesting, yeah. yeah. That's right, but he, but but it probably to my father it also represented um, a moment where he could get short of this recalcitrant, um, <laughs> uh, self-proclaimed genius, and uh, you know get short of uh, all of his kids once and for all, and enjoy, you know, what, what he had left of his um, uh, retirement years. And um, I, I was very grateful when. Uh, after auditioning uh, amongst many, uh, but on the final day of auditions with Jethro Tull, Ian Anderson sent the the rest of the band out and asked me, you know, puffing away on the pipe, layer of Strathair <laughs> style, with, tell me, Peter, do you want do you want to do the gig? And I was going, yes, of course. And he said, well, of course, you'll have to you'll have to get a bit of uh, publishing because you've been you've been playing so tune bits of tunes. I like that, and we'll do some of that on the next album which was going to be uh broadsword and the beast okay yep and um 
and, and I didn't know what publishing mm. was. And he said, and then you come on tour, and then he offered me what uh, what would be an, the most extravagant uh, uh, um, amount of money per week to go and tour with Jethro Tull. And um, and Ian definitely uh, changed the, the course of my existence, mm-hmm. that's for sure, for which I'm eternally grateful. Um, interestingly enough, a few days ago, a, a Jethro Tull fan that... Um, that uh, that I speak to on Facebook just published um not published but just showed me um a, a piece in the a book I think it's a, a book or something a biography of Jethro Tull um called the Ballad of Jethro Tull and it's um it's Ian you know trying to explain wh- why I was so unpopular amongst the Jethro Tull fans um uh which in print doesn't look particularly nice <laughs> but I know that. Uh, Ian would be saying this in jest. And um, so I went on to do um, uh, Broadsword and the Beast with Jethro Tull, toured the world with them, then went on to work with Ian on his so-called uh, solo album, Walk Into Light. And that extended on into doing a, a, an album called Under Wraps with Jethro Tull. And it was about midway through the making of that album that I, I understood that, um, that my tenure... Um, in Jethro Tull uh, was doing neither Jethro Tull nor myself any good. Yeah. Um, uh, so I, I already decided to uh, to move on. And um, at the end of the the last tour I did with um, Jethro Tull, uh, I was I received a telegram from Jeff Beck's management asking if I would like to go and join the the Jeff Beck band mm-hmm. of the time. Uh, which I did, but uh, sadly it was to do a tour um, that was in support of his album Flash at the time, and Jeff wasn't very keen on the album, and uh, the whole thing kind of fizzled out. Right. But by that time I was, um, this is a, a really potted history, by that time I'd I'd started to do sessions with, um, I wanted to do every kind of music humanly feasible uh, you know everything and present myself into uh, you know those areas that were both unsuitable for me and things that I thought I could do and you know I had to push to uh, to do heavy reading uh, gigs like when I, I I did Richard Niles Bandzilla which was the the house band for the the Ruby Wax TV uh, oh, yeah. program that was heavy you know every Friday a new chart heavy Richard is an awesome writer, but it was hard to get through. And then combine that with um, doing sessions that were uh, with you know within my uh, understanding and and taste, um, you know. But just, just do a, 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 just everything that I could, not from any sense of greed or avarice, but through wanting to experience a very yeah. youthful. Yeah, desire, approach. isn't it? And yeah, yeah. And so the self-proclaimed genius, as you, you your dad, or, or you, I was, I was never yeah. self-proclaimed. I was, a, 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 I was just, um, that was a projection of what my dad, dad probably was saying, thought. Yeah, gotcha. I thought I was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so I've when you actually, that. no, that's, and I'm not certainly not getting that impression. Um, with, with Jethro Tull and, and Jeff Beck and stuff, what were the big learnings in that initial part of your career? As far as did you, how far did you have to lift based on what you'd previously done, and what what you know, what were the big ticket items for you that you had to learn or overcome? In terms of actual musicality yeah, or a way yeah. to behave? Are I, you talking purely musical Yeah, terms? well, I, I know that's your interest in, yeah, musical, absolutely, and yeah, other behaviour stuff's great as well, but no, the music, the musicality of it. Um, uh, from a pure music uh, sense, I, uh, I'd grown up um, swinging a lot, mm-hmm. um, I'd grown up, I realise, I look back on this, I realise, um, for instance, my uncle Googie, who's a great drummer, played with the Jimmy Smart Circus, Billy Smart is it, Circus, and um, he he was he was one of the drummers before the transition to a, a, a backbeat, a heavy backbeat, mm. um, would, uh, would uh, use the snare drum as a... Um, a way of accenting, you know, da do 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 ba ba do da do ba ga do ga go ba do ba. I loved that. I loved that um, kind of drumming. I, I I think of it as compositional drumming, um, from swing and bebop uh, through to early 
early rock when the the drummers were transitioning out uh, out of the just uh, just using the snare as a a, a, a means of uh, accent to you know providing this uh, regular backbeat. Um, so my uncle, I realised that also my eighth notes swung all nearly all the time, <laughs> but, uh, and. Um, so when I started uh, doing sessions, and I particularly noticed this about me, when uh, when I I left Jethro Tull, and I was doing a, uh, an album with a band called um, Fornarth out in New York, and um, uh, you know that band that did um, I'll be waiting. Oh yeah, yeah, very much that. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah. and um, uh, uh, I didn't play on that, but I I played on a subsequent album, and um, uh, and I was I was doing these replacing bass parts and stuff like that, and um, the drums had already been laid, and the 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 drummer, very good drummer, but it he he wasn't terribly accurate with the click. It would drift in and out of of the click. You know, it would accelerate into a chorus and then drop back. Nothing wrong with that, uh, you know. It was just that was the those were the standards of the time, but um, but I noticed that first of all the eights that I would play had to be consistent, and then if the tempo itself would vary, um, that if you vary this this the tempo of eights. You've got to do it in such a way that, um, that, in my mind, has to maintain the equal distance uh, between each eighth note, mm. even although that particular bar may now no longer be at the same tempo as the previous bar. And, of course, the worst part of it is the transition from one tempo to another, even if it's slight. Mm. So you get the idea of going... <laughs> as it goes up and down in tempo. Yeah. <laughs> and so I, I was made very aware when I... Uh, uh, certainly in Jethro Tull, and uh, then on into Jeff Beck and many other sessions, that um, that the one thing I was uh, I, I was very um, well aware of at least was that I was a natural, so-called natural, but learned swinger. Um, but but I learned um, assiduously to play even eights yeah. uh, and sixteenths. And um, and now I, I I now I know I have no natural I have no natural fallback position. Uh, I now no longer play a swing eighth note unless the context or if I'm called uh, yeah. upon to do so. But I still feel very comfortable um, uh, playing uh, swing. But I feel very com comfortable playing straight um, eighth notes or. And then in with uh, Jeff Beck is when I, uh, well, in, in certainly in Jethro Tull, uh, there were odd time signatures, a few mm. odd time signatures like Black Sunday or uh, I remember the beginning of songs from the wood. And you know that, uh, the, the oh, well, actually it's in the middle of songs from the wood by Jethro Tull. Mm -hmm. But we used to start it with the very funny time thing and then doing the, Depends how you count it, the seven, eight, or the nine, eight of yeah. uh, Black Sunday, um, and uh, you know some you can you can count through it as straight and use the the um, the seventh, eighth note as a just as an accent. Um, but um, th those things I became aware of. Those were big, as you say, big ticket items. But to become a little bit more analytical about the. Um, placement of notes and uh, va note value as well. Um, I, I became much more sensitive to that um, placement and uh, length. And then, of course, by the time that MIDI showed up, we all became much more uh, sensitive to velocity. Um, but my piano tuition and and um, also I I learned a couple of different ways of, of fingering um, various scales. Um, I was always aware of um, what became known in MIDI terms as velocity, but um, mm. uh, and then in piano uh, studies, there's a singing tone called cantabile, and um, understanding uh, the nature of escapement when the the hammer drops drops back from the string, uh, or or 
or you can press on. So those those uh, those things uh, became uh, instead of instead of being non cognized, they became very uh, for a while. Um, I would um, they became cognitive items, things that I would bring to mind yeah, yeah. and be very aware of, so that um, so I hoped I was learning. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, at risk of severely um, summarising what, what's an amazing career, what were the next, like to, to me, sitting on the outside, things like Simple Minds was obviously a big one, playing the Nelson Mandela Freedom Concert, stuff like that. Um, what, what are some of the standout memories for you over that subsequent period? And I said I'm severely summarising what yeah. a, a number of years there. Well, uh, the Simple uh, simple Minds was... Um, uh, oh, Really, I I did the Simple Minds because um, I'd been working actually uh, not long after I left Jethro Tull. Um, I'd been working with a, a fellow called Steve Lipson, who uh, was uh, the engineer or Trevor Horn's engineer, and then became a producer mm -hmm. in his own right. And uh, Steve and I had a, a good connection. The connection was, uh, by the way, a lot of these connections, as I'm sure other musicians uh, talk about, it, 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 in my life, barely ever um, touch upon uh, being musical connections. They're, they're always about human connections, something, yeah. there's some, uh, there's some um, character or, or something about it, that, some shared nuanced aspect of identity that um that um that you gravitate to and uh, anyway so it was with steve lips and i'd gone on to do uh with steve um the three annie lennox solo albums um yep and um it's simple i can't remember uh, it was simple minds first or second i think i'd been working with steve and he took me up to their well, he took me out to Wieselord to do to start working out on um, the real life album with Simple Minds, and um, yeah. the 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 truth is um, the connection musical connection uh, again was was one thing. It was the joy of music, of course, but the real connection with uh, Simple Minds was, uh, of course, the 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 humans, the squashy biological entities that would be <laughs> um, Charlie and Jim, and their desire and their their authenticity of purpose and mm. uh, you know their integrity and um i, I like that very much um and um so i did the real life album then did a uh, as, as as you said i did the mandela um uh when when he was released and um that i suppose Sadly, maybe this is not what you'd want to hear, but it was simply being uh, uh, being there, uh, in some way connected to Nelson Mandela, um, yeah. uh, was was actually the high point. And that we played, and that Jim and Charlie were really, uh, you know, absolutely authentic about about the reasons they were there uh, for as well. That was that was great. So, so it was that night was in simple minds terms was was not about music. That was about um, no. Nelson Mandela, and to to me, all the better for it. Um, but it was an expression of our, our, you know, our understanding and our empathy and so on and so forth via music. Of course, it was. Um, but then, um, I suppose if if you're asking me for musical highlights, and of course we're um, um, short on time, but um, uh, that would be a uh, that would be a musical highlight, but nothing to do with music, and um, or as I've just expressed, uh, you know, it's 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 a highlight of a of a life that I've lived that that has had music as as its um, foundation and foundation, um, yeah. and propellant. But um, uh, here, you know, this is another great thing. Um, I also uh, think that, uh, of course, um, Jethro Tull um, was a huge highlight of my career, but it was at the beginning of my career. It wasn't the zenith of my career. It's, no. it's often, it, it, I suppose it's, there's a, I suppose there's a cult of Ian Anderson that that grows up around Jethro Tull fans, quite understandably so, because he is brilliant. Um, you know, but it might be it might be offensive, um, you know, to some of them. But that that I was, I was only ever going to be passing through. That wasn't 
that um, Ian and I yeah. had great things together, that it wasn't terribly well received by the fans is 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 not the is not ultimately the the thing that I think would be the the quality that both Ian and I uh, would would take out of the experience. Um, we had a great um, a, a, a very great Ian mentored me in so many things, and um, I, I, I'm eternally grateful for that. But but it was also important for me to to leave Jethro Tull and to carry on evolving as a musician. After that, I suppose the other highlight was uh, playing with Paul McCartney when Richard Niles, who I've discussed yeah. before, a uh, great arranger, took me down uh, to Paul's house to... Paul was refurbishing um, uh, an album um, uh, which were Wings tracks that hadn't made the records, but he thought were too... Mm. Um, at least I, this is my uh, post-rationalised, uh, you know, projected reason why he might do this. Uh, Wings tracks I hadn't made the the records, but um, but he thought were too good to leave, and so we refurbished them. And I got to meet Paul and to chat with Paul. And um, I said to Paul because I was such a Beatles fan when I was a young boy, of yeah. course. Um, I said to Paul, and this was true. I, I'd written a whole load of songs when I was about seven. Let's see, I'd be about six or seven, beginning of the Beatles, sixty three, and. Um, and uh, my parents had sent this tape down to the Beatles, wherever that was, I didn't know. They sent the tape <laughs> to the Beatles. And uh, anyway, all these years later, and I'm, I'm sitting in, uh, with Paul in, his, you know, in Hastings, and uh, I said to him, you know, Paul, um, I sent you a tape when I was seven, and I received no reply. It was all my own <laughs> songs. I received no reply. And Paul McCartney went out, um, he'd gone out and it was lunchtime and he'd gone out and he came back and he had a jiffy bag and he went, he came back and he said, Peter, you won't believe it, your tape's just arrived. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, of course it wasn't the tape, but... Uh, no, but, uh, but it doesn't get much better than that. But it doesn't get much, well, it, it, it can't get any better and I tell the story of no. when, uh, actually it was when I was out doing uh, Forner in New York and I received a phone call from from Paul's manager of the time and saying, you know, that Paul was thinking about putting wings back together. Um, would I would I be interested in the idea of playing keyboards, uh, you know, if that were the case or something like it? But I was one of two, I think, two people that uh, that was under consideration at the time, and um, I, I I I said, let me let me think about that, please. Um, uh, of course, those offers don't come twice, and it probably was it. No. Um, I understand. Uh, uh, probably got off the phone and went, "Well, he can shove it up his arse anyway." Um, <laughs> and um, but the reason I I hesitated because uh, because in a you know in a, this utopian or this uh, idealistic youthful way, I thought perhaps. There is a very real, uh, a real chance that I've experienced the greatest thing that uh, that um, um, a schoolboy could ever, uh, uh, you know, uh, an ambition that a schoolboy could ever hope to achieve, which is, after dreaming for so long of getting to play with Paul McCartney, I have done, and it mm. wasn't like like it was a mark on a bedpost or a or any of those things. It wasn't chalking up this to. Uh, you know, to some kind of fatuous, um, um, you know, uh, rite of passage. It, it, it was that I thought, I still think, I I got the very best out of that situation simply simply by hesitating um, at that point. Uh, that may be post rationalised, but uh, but given that uh, my my own personal um, ethos or uh, desires would be to evolve and continue evolving if it's if it's possible to continuously of what I do believe it is uh, if it is possible to evolve uh, musically and spiritually throughout a lifetime um, then perhaps those were moments that uh, that like miles Davis I got it I loved it I left it behind um, and yeah. um, but there's nothing fatuous or or um, disdainful or contemptuous about when I asked, can I think about it? It was a real, just a real 
moment of uh, the, the sliding doors moment. Yeah, that's right. And and it sounds like, Peter, that unlike the, the kid at the talent quest dressed up as the baby, you're not waking up in the middle of the night going, oh, my God, I wish I'd gone ahead with wings. No, I know. Because, first of all, uh, he, he's got a keyboard player, Paul Wickens, who's absolutely brilliant and um, uh, and that suits the band terrifically. And Paul has, <laughs> you know, he, he hasn't needed me. Um, he, <laughs> he, he's never needed anybody. But um, uh, but again, there's a there's another three or four, possibly five podcasts uh, as to the the difference between um, you know this desire and longing. One which is the you know you're compelled or you're pushed from behind, and the other which you feel drawn to, and it's a it's a complex it's a complex um, issue, and um, does. You know, after all these years, of course, I'm I, I've had a chance to to uh, think about it and and possibly come up with something a bit rationalised, um, or that sounds it sounds it sounds when I speak about it, it sounds like it's rational. I believe it's irrational, um, um, but the Greeks had this covered um, uh, with a word called um, a word. It's called akrasia when you um, act against your better judgment. But oh, then, yeah. uh, even then, I was I was asking the question: What's what what judgment of mine is better than my judgment? Mm. Uh, you know, I, yeah. I don't know if judgment is hierarchical in in that regard. I don't know if you reserve your best judgment for the best of moments. Uh, so, anyway, I could go on. Yeah, no, it's a great point, and. Um... Just on love for different artists and, and instruments, I know um, you you love a little bit of Hammond organ, to say the least. So I was just interested in a bit of a, a sideline there on on Hammond organ, your relationship with it, and um, like I know you've played, for example, um, with Zuccaro and, yeah. and others. Yeah, t- tell us a little bit about that for you as, as far as a bit of a, an experience. You're, you're very well uh, researched. David, thank you very much for um, uh, for putting that time in. Um, in relation to the Hammond organ, it's 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 the thing that um, that a plug-in or a computer and all the rest of it. We've talked about it at, at great length, all of us since days of yore. Mm. Is that um, there's nothing like a great big bit of furniture, um, uh, you know, that you can feel. As I said at the beginning of the interview, uh, you know, some some kind of relationship with that that has elements of the abstract. You know, it makes a noise, and it's that noise can be made into your idea of what noise is. Uh, but also, it's 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 a thing that has a a very a heavy presence, um, almost a gravitation. This is the thing about uh, desire versus longing, or desire as distinct from longing. It has a, it has gravitational pull. In the case of a Hammond, it probably has actual gravitational pull due yes. to its mass. Um, and um, and of course, um, you know, for um, people of my generation, there there was always that horrible moment at the end of a night when, when I used to cart about a Hammond L a hundred. Um, uh, at the end of the night, asking who'd like to volunteer to help me lift this yeah. sorting thing out, you know, <laughs> you know, which was now two stories up in some some dimly lit club. And um, but my my relationship with the Hammond is that about a, a, a thing which is um, a little bit like Wayne Shorter. Not not that I'm comparing myself to Wayne Shorter, but when Wayne Shorter was asked about um, uh, you know why the saxophone Wayne, and he goes on to say. Uh, because it was shiny. Uh, I feel <laughs> I feel about Hammond organ. Why the Hammond organ? Because it's heavy. Um, yes. And there's uh, and there's there's something glorious about it. My own Hammond organ in the studio is a 1963 wax cap uh, C3. Um, oh, yep. It's a glorious thing. It's temperamental. It's it it can have. It can be anthropomorphized. Anthropomorphized. Let's get that word right. Anthropomorphized. Um, in that, uh, you know, one might be tempted to call it a he or a she. It's mm. truculent. Um, it's belligerent. Uh, 
but it's wonderful. And uh, I've uh, I've always loved it. And when because I, le I learned to play bass pedals um, when I was young and the manuals uh, spread as they are with that uh, offset as well as piano. Um, when when I was called in to by Karad Rustici, who was the producer, brilliant guitar player as well, but um, I was called in to play uh, on Zucchero's uh, Miserere album. That's the one he did with uh, Pavarotti. Oh, yeah. And um, Zucchero and Carado liked the spontaneity that I could, um, uh, and I I enjoyed their enjoyment of my spontaneity because I thought. You know, you can't be spontaneous with people that aren't spontaneous. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you have to rely, you know, it's, um, um, you know, we all have to be in that room. And um, so so uh, I may have to justify that statement. That's That seemed like a universal, <laughs> uh, um, uh, that was a, I may back out of that one. But anyway, they were spontaneous and I was spontaneous. And in fact, um, there was a song on that, that album, uh, Miserere, that uh, called Miss Mary. And in the middle of it, I'm playing Hammond and bass pedals. It's a live take. And for the very first time, Zuccaro shouted at me, take a solo. <laughs> and uh, oh, so, the, so the solo, it's a, there's a mistake in it. And uh, so the solo that, uh, that I played on Miss Mary is the first take. It's live. And it's the very, it's because he shouted take a solo. And in, in that way that uh, software instrument which are all great, of course. Uh, what I did was the very great thing that a Hammond will allow you to do. When somebody shouts that, I pulled some drawbars out and I stuck yes. my foot flat on the floor and I started to wail as best as I knew how. Uh, you know, mistakes included. Um, that's uh, That, I think, would uh, give you an insight uh, uh, into the, the joyous nature of the instrument, or at least the joy that I can derive from sitting in front of one of those. That, that doesn't yeah, account yeah. for what an audience uh, makes of it. That I, I can't legislate for that, but uh, I can, no. I can assure you, I can assure you that uh, I, I was having a ball. That's a, that's a great story. Um, and I, I do want to um, briefly cover too, obviously your songwriting, arranging and, and composing career. And, and one thing that I did notice when doing my research is there's quite, not intentionally obviously, but quite an Australian connection. So between, See a Robin Gibb, who I understand we claim is Australian. I know he did come from the UK. Um, you did some work with Australian Idol, I believe, and even with Heather Small with Proud and the 2000 Olympics. There's, there's a bit of an Aussie connection there, I noticed. Yeah, and Tina Arena. Oh, really? Oh, yeah, well, she's uh, an Australian uh, legend. That's yeah. right. Uh, and uh, I did an album with um, Tina. Um, it was it was way back um, before Nile Rogers was famous again. And um, <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> and he produced half of the album, and I produced uh, half of the album. Um, I I I'd been working on this uh, uh, writing songs with Tina. In fact, we we had a hit in France with Symphony of Life, which is a kind of groove uh, item and um, uh, typical of myself in relation to other writers. It's uh, you know it's the idea of questioning. In the second verse of Proud, for instance. You know, um, you you'll hear bits of um, sixty-year philosophy of um, um, <laughs> a realize to question is how we grow. Um, you know, that's uh, these are all just uh, parts of my uh, uh, evolution as a thinker and a doer. Um, but it was yeah, the same yeah. with Tina and, and Aussie connection. Um, um, Aussie, do I like do I like those epithets anymore? I probably don't, but I'm not particularly woke. Um, um, but the Australian connection <laughs> is, is I, I think, um, uh, coincidental, I think, but you can never tell, can you? Because there's a, there, there is a, there, there is something. And, and with Robin Gibb, I'd done three Bee Gees albums. I'd gone out to do, um, what was the name of the album? They had their first American top 10 with, I think it was called one or something. I can't remember what was the name of the album. Oh yeah. Yep. But, uh, yep. And. And I went out to work with the Bee Gees because um, that was another highlight. You know, I got a call from a session agency saying, right, go down to Mayfair studio uh, this forthcoming, this is Thursday night, forthcoming Monday morning a session. And I'm going, who with? The Bee Gees. Yeah. Go, you, you've <laughs> yeah. got to be. This was about 1988. And I go, you get, wow. Yeah. Wee. 
so anyway, I, I went down to Mayfair, set my stuff up, and uh, introduced myself to uh, Barry and Robin and Morris, and I loved them. Uh, the, yeah. the, again, it was the the music was lovely, and the band was it was great. It was, the band was uh, myself, um, Steve Ferroni on drums, Nathan East on bass, and Tim Cansfield wow. on guitar. Uh, most of us were in the control room. Steve was in the the live room, uh, obviously playing the drums. Uh, but Barry and Morris and Robin were also in the control room with us all. So it was just a great, great thing. The people uh, couldn't couldn't be better. And the music, um, again, I can't legislate for others, but um, but that experience was extraordinary. And I, I began to uh, form a friendship with Robin that was about slightly, I suppose you could say it was, you know, in, 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 no, in no other context could you say uh, underdog, but I, I, I believe because Robin had, um, uh, I, apart from his falsetto, he had a real voice, a you know, head voice, and a chest voice that, um, mm. that was, it was tremulous, but but I thought wonderful, and it wasn't um, it wasn't represented enough. I didn't think, and uh, so there was one of it was one of those things uh, that I I started to want to have Robin. Uh, you know, I kind of started to urge Robin to keep keep pushing ahead. Uh, um, you know, with his own stuff and uh, so on and so forth. Um, and then I I produced and um, played on. Um, uh, what was it? Um, Don't cry alone. Don't cry alone. Yeah, and um, um, on it on an on an album. I mean, it's a fairly difficult experience because Robin by that time was starting to um, become unwell. Mm. Um, but um, I, I'm very grateful. Uh, that's another thing I'm hugely grateful having known uh, Barry and Morris and Robin, having witnessed the umpteen arguments that we'd have. They were brothers, they yeah. loved one another, but they were, boy, oh boy, that was a tempestuous uh, relationship that yeah, they yeah. had. Uh, I often found myself, um, uh, you know, being um, yeah, uh, very close to having a keyboard jammed up my arse, never mind any, <laughs> <laughs> never mind any of the rest of them. But it was a... a, 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 a Great, a great time, I have to say. So, um, yes, I know that they um, they went over to seek their fortune in in Australia, and um, and that that was highly formative. And they they speak, uh, well, as you'll know, they speak very fondly uh, of, of that experience. Yeah. Um, so um, I can't remember who else is um, Australian, but um, so yeah, uh, so yeah, I mean, so, and it just, I mean, it really shows the extent of your career to someone like Sia. Comp- is a, a contemporary artist that you've worked with, and, and how did you find that experience? Well, it was the same thing, and, and truthfully, Sia put me through a ringer. Uh, it was um, uh, <laughs> this was before she'd become um, a pop artist, and um, she'd released a, a, a countless a, a number of album albums, uh, all of which were glorious. And um, uh, I I had to go and attend, and I say had to because. There was a thing that used to happen. I don't. I don't do it much anymore. I don't know if it goes on that much anymore. But I'm too much out of the loop. Um, is they would have these writing camps. Uh, the oh, yeah. the publisher would have a writing camp, and on this particular writing camp, it was it was I think the second or third one I did. Where the first one I did was, the the idea was I think it was quite noble the idea which was the uh, which is you go down to. Uh, this place where there are no telephones and you put, you know, 20 songwriters in this huge old mansion with no, mm. uh, no, uh, no communication to the outside world. And uh, they each form into groups of three, I guess there were 21 and uh, groups of three. And each day they would go and write a song, but there would be no technology. All we had were dictaphones and uh, <laughs> a piano and a, or a guitar. That was a hideous experience. Um, and um, one that I enjoyed very much, and um, uh, I, 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 on the uh, the end of that particular uh, visit, I, I wrote the um, and who will forget uh, this one? Uh, I wrote two chickens fighting, um, 
<laughs> which was the I'd recorded. I, we couldn't get anywhere the day that I had two other people in my room trying to write a song, and nobody liked any anything that was happening. So I recorded uh, two chickens that just so happened to be fighting outside my window, and um, <laughs> that's what we performed that night, albeit to um, to a lovely background of of uh, altered chords. Um, but on the second or third. Um, on the second or third uh, writing camp, I met Sia, but she put me through it. She came into my room, and by this time we could have, I had my Pro Tools rigged down there and keyboard, and uh, there was myself and Cliff, whose second name I've forgotten now, very great. Oh, geez, I'm so sorry. I've forgotten his second name. Perhaps you That's have right. to. And Sia. And Sia, I think, regarded both. Cliff and I, uh, but especially me, as an industry hack. Um, yeah, okay. uh, uh, you know, I'd I'd done all this and I'd complied and I'd uh, I'd conformed with all the normative standards of what constituted songwriting of the day and come up with these, you know, what she would have considered then to be, you know, these inane, innocuous uh, things just on the basis of being a rollover, or at least that she she gave me that uh, impression. <laughs> Um, but she and I and Cliff went on to write a, a, what I think is a, v a very beautiful song. And she was having a moment, uh, uh, you know, and the song's called You Have Been Loved by Somebody Good. Mm. Anyway, uh, we wrote that and it got done. But it wasn't till after we'd written the song that C and I made a connection. And it was the oddest connection. But it was one that I like very much. And it refers to... Um, uh, what I talked about before. Uh, how did I connect with Sia? Not musically, not lyrically, yeah. but I think we did a good, uh, a, a lovely song. Uh, but that wasn't the connection. Our connection uh, happened later on that night when we were both found to be great fans of interpretive jazz dancing, and uh, <laughs> uh, 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 and both went on to try and ex uh, explain through the through the gift of dance uh, concepts such as. Um, I've left home, but I think I may have left the oven on and a summer's day. Um, <laughs> um, and that's when C and I actually uh, um, connected with one another. That that connection, um, um, it didn't stand the test of time because uh, clearly these these kinds of things are forced and false. Anyway, I mean the songwriting yeah. camps. And uh, they, they are understandably and probably should be ephemeral, although they can give rise to further collaborations uh, in ways that you didn't expect. Um, but uh, with Sia, um, I, I was a, was kind of uh, shocked when I, I heard, um, you know, um, the, uh, the vocal on Titanium, which was absolutely brilliant, of course. And the song was, you know, I mm. think it was great. But it was, but it was absolutely not the the um, the uh, the frame of mind that Sia uh, certainly at the beginning of the day regarded me, um, which is disappoint <laughs> disappointing because I think you know these are these are the problems with perception and um, and prejudice yeah. and bias and so on. We we know all of these things. I I I I might not have gotten the best out of Sia, but she certainly didn't get the best out of me. That's for sure. There you go. Yeah, no, interesting story. And um, just on interpretive jazz dance to segue to one-man choirs and, and going <laughs> back to he Heather Small. So, I mean, there's a great story there. Well, it's not just a story, it's a truth about how you have essentially pulled off 20 years as a one-man choir on a, a big hit from Heather Small. That's right. Because I worked out it's roughly 20 years old this year, I think. Yeah. Oh, well, um, yeah, it, it, this, is, this is quite a thing. And um, I can reveal now because it's um, – it's it's so long. I often show up in uh, record. I, I never used to do this, but I I, I think it's it's fun and it, it's good that um, I, I often show up as credited as the Saint Bibiana Choir. Um, <laughs> Saint Bibiana is the patron saint of mental disorders and headaches, oh, and uh, and, um, <laughs> and, and and not to disparage uh, you know mental disorders not at all. No no no. Um um. And not making light of it at all, but um, I, I often wouldn't um, claim, uh, you know, having uh, sung anything on on any record because um, uh, <clears throat> it's because my uh, this is the long discussion, uh, uh, you know, uh, 
the concept of personal identity and um, persistence of identity and so on and so forth. But um, but um, I didn't perceive myself as as a singer. But I've often thought, how do people think I write a song if I don't sing something to them? Uh, you know, when they come into the room and go, well, what, have you got any ideas? And I just play a few doodles on a piano. Might have said, might have served me better, right enough. But um, um, <laughs> when it came to Heather, I'd been singing backing vocals on tons of stuff. It's not that the the um, and it's not that they may have been the deciding factor, but in 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 the case of Heather, it was simply that I had to. Because halfway through the day, when Heather and I were writing that song, we got a phone call from her manager saying, have you got anything? There's a Peugeot ad that are looking for songs. Have you got anything? And we said, well, we're doing this thing. And um, so, so once we finished uh, singing the song, which had a gospel flavour, and, and um, Heather uh, left, I went on to do, you know, just to mock up, you know, the, the idea of a gospel choir uh, singing this thing. And um, when when I did the record properly, I did get in uh, Lance Ellington and uh, Tommy Blaze, and who are great singers, and they did sing on top of that that choir. But in in fact, the bulk of the the sound of the choir of Proud is uh, is me is uh, singing. And what I, what I couldn't get rid of in the final production was the the desire to make it happen. Which was from the, you know, that's got a metaphysical substance. I know that mm -hmm. there'll be philosophers around here. But if the philosophers are listening to this, I'm sorry, I may be a Cartesian dualist. Um, I, I, I may believe, to a certain extent, there's a metaphysical substance to the, uh, to the, the, the statement of uh, the sum is greater than the parts, and um, I. I uh, I think there was something to the desperation <laughs> of trying to get that to work. I lost mm. my voice doing that, uh, singing. Uh, it was like uh, uh, probably there's two times, there's probably six, six of each har each um, a part of the harmony, um, uh, probably done. Uh, what's it? It's about you know, probably ten parts of the harmony maybe um yeah. and then i i did it four four times over so the, I, I don't know what that would be um you know 40 times enough to lose your voice as enough, you said. well i showed up at the doctor <laughs> he was brilliant though I, 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 I he was absolutely brilliant because um he brought me back down to earth i went look um i've lost my voice he looked at my throat and i said I, I, and he said how'd you do that i said i was singing and he, and, and um he, i said so what can i do and he said stop singing <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah, you know, that's I, amazing. It's, I mean, accurate, but I mean, I, I, I would have preferred Tommy Cooper to, to have told me that. Um, that's uh, right. But, uh, but yeah, but it's the truth. <laughs> anyway, I didn't stop singing. When I went on to do a, a Joe Cocker album, produce a Joe Cocker album, I was doing the backing vocals for Joe Cocker. And um, to unite Joe's uh, vocal sound, which was very distinct, with a mm. with a with a choir, I had to uh, I had to sing with that the, you know what Steve Lipson calls angry voice, <laughs> and um, uh, and so anyway, uh, suffice it to say, two days later I'm I'm back in the surgery and I'm going, eh, wh what's your advice now? It was still the same. Stop singing, and stop, <laughs> stop singing like singing. Joe Cocker, you nutcase. <laughs> As if I could. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> now, Peter, we, we're going to wrap up with two questions that we always ask, and I have a feeling you'll have difficulty narrowing both these down, but one we all always ask is the greatest train wreck. So in your case, it could be on stage, it could be in production. What's the biggest train wreck you've ever had, now, musically or technically? It's, 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 it's very, very clear. It's the, it's the best one ever. And it was the reason... That 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 first instilled the idea in my head that uh, with Jethro Tull I was going no further, and it was the last <laughs> day of uh, I, I I talk about it. it was the um look before the caveat being uh, that Ian Anderson was really struggling with his voice, and he pulled off an entire what eighty four date tour 
and put his voice into such jeopardy just to keep this show on the road. And it's the mark mm. of a, a, a brilliant man that he would do this. However, yeah. um, uh, however, it was three nights to go. We were at the Universal Amphitheater in LA. And on the first night, when we <clears throat> when we played um, a, a tune for Jethro Tull fans, they'll know this tune. For those that don't, um, uh, I'll sing the riff. Um, it's a tune called Hunting Girl. And uh, the riff goes da 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 ba da ba da 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 and uh, uh, to the accompaniment of the sound of the whacking sound of a, a, a riding crop. And um, anyway, on this night, the the uh, brilliant uh, American drummer um, Don Perry took, understandably, took the took the opportunity to demonstrate his prowess in a po- polyrhythmic fill um, in in the break of the riff of Hunting Girl. Sadly, uh, in the audience <clears throat> was uh, the winners of the uh, lap of luxury contest, the radio contest of the day, that had shown up in the front row and were uh, watching all of this happen as uh, as great Jethro Tull fans whilst rolling up a doobie. Um, and, um, <laughs> uh, and, and also it was, in the audience was uh, the keyboard magazine... Uh, correspondent because that year I'd come second in the best newcomers in the um oh, yeah. uh, and, which kind of gives lie to the fact a, a little bit at least to the fact that um that um Jethro Tull fans didn't like me and Jethro Tull um <laughs> uh, but I can understand why they wouldn't of course and um uh, anyway so the riff goes on uh, and Don embarks upon this huge m- fantastic polyrhythmic fill. Um, Ian, understandably, and I know this about singers, they're not really, they're not going to be standing about counting, you know, um, they're out no. there entertaining. And uh, Ian lost his place and he pressed the uh, riding crop in the wrong place. And um, and then he came back in and he was about, I, I don't know, it's, it's one of these really horrid, it, it, very difficult to calculate unless you were a fan of um, uh, Stockhausen or Schoenberg or, or perhaps uh, some of the tabla, <laughs> conical of Indian um, tabla speak. But um, he came in about, I, I would think about seven sixteenths away from where reality was taking place. And um, the band had managed to come in at the right time, so we carried on playing Hunting Girl. Ian was in the wrong place. and um, But Ian being Ian, uh, and understandably, had to continue on as if he was in the right place. Uh, That's right. And, um, and so, consequently, the band, uh, as individuals, began to try and accommodate where Ian was in the bar, <laughs> one by one. And uh, uh, this this dreadful, just it was a sad. What's what's the technical term for it? Oh yes, pile of shit took place. <laughs> and um, I, I, and <clears throat> but Ian, I followed him. The follow spot, the big you know the super trooper, followed Ian off. He jumped over the monitors into the audience. The follow spot went with him, and I could see. Um, accoutrement and flutes flying about and uh, and tins of <laughs> tins of dope and tobacco flying up into the air uh ian came back on the stage now the band was limping along in in a kind of a doing a, a kind of a five sixteenths version of the riff of hunting girl by this time and he he called the the whole thing to a, a halt so loud he blew his voice up uh-huh. And we stopped, and um, he w- turned around and berated the audience, and in particular um, the the people in the front row who were smoking these doobies that were aggravating his throat. And um, uh, so he he ran up to me and asked me to do the keyboard solo, and they and then all of the band departed the stage, 
And uh, the keyboard solo was, um, and I'm sure people will empathise with this. I had a prepared thing with a sequence that would uh, that I would play, and I'd play too, and I'd come out with a handheld and blah 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 with my cape flying and all the rest of it. It was it was all going to be proper, but because it because Ian said just play something, uh, I didn't have time to prepare it, so uh, I, I started to play. Guess what? And people, I'm sure, uh, empathise with this. Um, what Spin Spinal Tap called Jazz Odyssey. I hope you like our direction. <laughs> and uh, you know, uh, our bass player wrote this. So uh, I I started to play Jazz Odyssey. And um, I it was it was it went on too long. I can't say it was particularly bad, but it went on too long. I don't know. I was, I, 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 my heart, my blood pressure must have been up to 400 over Kids. nine. And, um, uh, and uh, anyway, they, uh, Ian, they all left the stage and they eventually coerced Ian to come back onto stage and we played the, a short, <laughs> a truncated version of the gig which was shambolic in itself. We had to shorten down because he couldn't sing Aqualung, sing, my friend, yeah. don't you start up. Just impossible. He'd, he'd blown his voice yeah. up completely. And I, I had real empathy for him, but it was so shambolic. And his his complete, the, the you know, just the complete failure to, just, it was a failure in all sorts of ways. Um, <laughs> I, I, and, um, I look back right now. Of course, I can put. A, of course, it's funny now because I'm going spinal tap and and I'm taking the rap. That's but right. truth, but truth, keyboard magazine didn't come and interview me that night. Uh, Ian uh, <clears throat> just, I think, uh, didn't do the following two nights in the Universal Amphitheatre. I understand why, of course, but it needn't have been like that. And um, it, it, I almost, I knew it was coming before uh, I knew something like this was going to happen because Don Perry had said, well, Pete, we've made it to the last gig. And I said, Don, you, you don't know, you don't know, what's, <laughs> uh, you don't know what's, what can happen here. And I'm telling you, anything can happen here. Now yeah. I'm not being critical of, of, of Ian. I think we were all no, no. found wanting uh, under those circumstances but it was uh, the biggest train wreck that I've ever been involved in. And it's, uh, it, it, uh, and if a train wreck, which I think, you know, literally and figuratively means that it means that your career can be derailed, uh, then that's what happened to me because I decided that was, that was the end of that. Um, from my perspective, I, I was going to be, uh, I was going to be, um, getting onto some other tracks, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, after that, but um, 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 please don't misunderstand me. I, I'm no, still no, forever grateful. All. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then um, the one that every guest hates is the Desert Island Discs question, Peter. Five I, albums you couldn't live without. I prepared. Yeah, <laughs> good. <laughs> um, I put them in chronological order, and I've tried to tell the truth uh, about um, uh, about you know the the. You know, these are meaningful to me uh, because they were also the albums that made the difference. You know, it's not just like you know when you you know what's the what's your top five books that you've read. You know, and somebody's going to have, of course, you know Nietzsche. Well, I did uh, Nietzsche yes. and, and and blah blah blah. <laughs> um, so uh, in chronological order, and um, uh, they are of course Sergeant Pepper. That there, there could. Uh, the, oh, yeah. the, and I'll, when I come to the end of this, uh, David, I'll, I'll justify my choices as well um, from a, from one particular uh, standpoint. But the first one is um, Sergeant Pepper, for all the very obvious reasons and for yes. reasons that are not so obvious. Then, because I was a, a keyboard player, I I um uh, uh, I gravitated to to those things that would feature virtuoso keyboard players and rock players. Um, uh, you know the burgeoning sweet spot for a you know um a then what would it be some can't remember six fifteen sixteen seventeen and um so the next thing up would be the the core blimey amongus brilliance of Tarkus by um oh, yeah. ELP in nineteen seventy one yep um then in seventy two it would be can't buy a thrill uh, which is Steely Dan because by that time I was playing. Oh, yeah. Uh, things like uh, do it again, 
and um, and I went on to play loads of Steely Dan things. Love love the chords, the composition, the individuality. Mm. You know so much about it. Um, yeah. In seventy five, there was a there was an album that that it was incredibly, and I've looked back on it on, on many occasion. I wish I could communicate this directly to him because he's been such a a fantastic uh, influence and um, a guiding light uh, for me, certainly was at that time. The album's called Forest of Feelings, and it's by David Sanctus. Um, oh, yes. Uh, yep. Just great. Um, and so what's that? What, uh, and then of my five albums, and of course I've had to you know, miss out so many things, Herbie Hancock, um, um, George Duke, you know, for the keyboard players and so on and so forth. But um, the next one would be um, um, 73 uh, would be Inner Visions by um, Stevie Wonder because this was the oh, yeah. this was the the fact that I'm that I uh, write songs uh, I like um, the idea of popular songs. Is certainly as uh, when espoused uh, or uh, evinced by Stevie Wonder. Also, I loved Stevie Wonder's drumming. Uh, I, I mean, apart from yeah. the brilliant, I mean, you know, f- forget it, singing, oh my God, piano playing, oh my God, composition, mm. oh, help, uh, the drumming, living for the city. Oh, for heaven's sakes. So, yeah. um, so Inner Visions. And then at the very, very uh, pinnacle uh, for me, uh, that's a life, a lifetime, changed my life, could not have lived without him and them. It would be um, Black Market uh, by Weather Report. Gotcha. Um, yeah. That was, um, uh, you know, that, that was 76, but that was the... Um, that was the thing. I was going to say the 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 perspective that I have about this, and it's I was reading um a, a Joe Zawinul quote about it was about when Jacko auditioned um when they were doing um, what was the song um Cannonball, and Jacko came to audition so called audition for uh, Weather Report, but um at the time uh, Zawinul was quoted as saying um you know about the whole thing about Jacko playing out and hey, man, don't play that shit on my song and all the rest of it. And he would say something like, uh, he said, we're a group, not a bunch of individual musicians. And these are mm. the things that I think that all of these albums, maybe with, of course, with the exception of um, Stevie Wonder, who, yeah. you know, is, 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 of course, unique, but that album had players on it that, that played as a band, that sounded like a band, that, same with David Sanchez, uh, the, the the band that was Steely Dan, the band that was ELP, the band that was that was the Beatles. These these were great individuals, but this metaphysical substance of the sum is greater than uh, uh, than the parts. Um, um, how extraordinary! Um, and I'm yeah. very grateful to have lived in a time that um you know lived in this time and also there's another thing about it which is i think don't want to sound like an old furry dirty but I'm missing from popular song now is there's there's an energy and a desire i talked about it before a desire a desire to, a need to get this on record somehow a real zesty something um, um when zawinul was talking about um for instance uh, narada michael walden um, on playing on the actual title cut of uh, Black Market um, because it starts off with Chester Thompson playing the drums uh, but then switches, you can hear the, the switch, it's, it does switch to Narada Michael Walden later on uh, and uh, both are brilliant of course but the the zest and the energy and the desire, those are the things that, that uh, have typified Anything that I'm I'm drawn to. Of course, I love cerebral. Uh, of course, I, I love the beautifully crafted. I love the spontaneous, so on and so forth. It's the energy. Punk brought energy um, to to the whole scene in the late seventies, but um, but but I'm not. But I wasn't a huge fan of the music. But mm-hmm. it was that zesty, visceral 
human um, uh, quality that uh, I so love about the, my desert island. I think that's a beautiful way to to um, to end the desert island is because, and I think it also reflects your career as far as zest and desire, and and it's it's obvious that um, you've applied both those throughout your career, and um, in the many more years hopefully to come um, with with your ongoing career. I, I mean, I feel like I've got a thousand more questions and you may be the first one, Peter, to be asked back for a second episode. Well, uh, please do, um, because I've got a thousand and two answers. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so, no, I, I can't can't thank you enough for the time today. It's been absolutely brilliant. And, yeah, we definitely will be in touch. But, um, yeah, keep safe and um, we'll hopefully talk again soon. I hope so, David. And and thank you very much for asking me. And, uh, and of course, uh, I understand that the situation can is, uh, you know, tenuous um you know for for all of us and um uh, i do hope you can stay safe and stay well so there we have it and without a word of a lie i think you could get peter on a podcast for three episodes and still barely scratch the surface of what's been an amazing career so yeah, huge thank you again to Peter for taking part. And um, when we do do the rounds again with different guests, Peter will be first on the list, I can assure you. Um, the Keyboard Chronicles will be back again in a fortnight or so, but just a reminder that you can keep in touch via a few means. Our website is www.keyboardchronicles.com. Um, we're on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash keyboard chronicles or on Twitter at the keyboard chr1. If you like good old-fashioned email, then as always, do drop us a line at editor at keyboardchronicles.com. Um, if you'd like to become an official supporter, we do have a Patreon account where for the price of a coffee a month, you can help us go from strength to strength. That's at patreon.com forward slash keyboardchronicles. Um, yes, yeah, so most importantly, thanks to you for listening, and we hope to see you back here next episode.